Uh, so thank you for the kind words. Uh, I'm now gonna start uh, with my session. So uh, if you don't know me, my name is Stanislav Gilaspov. Uh, most people call me Stan uh, for obvious reasons. Um, today we're gonna talk about exporting configuration management in Azure. Uh, basically, um, before proceeding to the agenda for the day, um, the slides will be mostly uh, very uh, a few slides, I would say, and mostly I will try to demo some stuff and try to explain some stuff uh, by showing some some examples, etc. So, uh, hoping that kind of way will be uh, more engaging to you uh, for this one. Uh, so let's start with the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk about what is configuration management in very short. Uh, I'm pretty sure that most of you already know that. Uh, why do you need configuration management as well? Um, that I'm pretty sure that also many of you already know why you need it, but uh, it's good to get reminded about that. Um, we're going to look at change tracking and inventory. Uh, that's a service in Azure, part of the Azure Automation Service. We're also going to look at Azure Application Change Analysis. Uh, you may know it also as Change History. Um, we're going to talk about that service and show some examples there. Um, maybe the, the bigger part of that session will focus on Azure Resource Management Manager Deployments. Um, because I think the way that uh, you should do your management is, is through that. Um, and no matter if you're using any of these services, you're going to need um, a resource manager in order to manage and uh, configure your resources. Uh, we're going to pass through Azure Automation State Configuration. Uh, and at, at last, we're going to look at Azure Policy as well. Uh, you're going to see why um, Azure Policy is part of that kind of configuration management, although it's also part of, of compliance, but um, um, Azure Policy can uh, serve those two um, needs together. And as I said, we're going to have them also all over the place. Uh, so why configuration management, uh, management right? Um, uh, this is basically a process for establishing and maintaining consistency. Um, so um, without configuration management, uh, you're going to have some someone doing some change, other one doing another change, and then these changes can uh, collapse. Um, and um, you're going to not, not know what, what, who, what anyone has done. And then um, you're going to have problems with your environment and uh, especially then with your uh, business because we will affect the, the ability and the performance of your uh, uh, business, whether it's application or something else. Um, configuration management also uh, manages the life cycle of, of the changes. Uh, so you can see what kind of changes are being made. You can review those changes, audit, and so on. Uh, and uh, allows you basically consistent, consistently moving from one change to another. Um, also, also allows you to document these changes. So uh, it's very easy when you, for example, um, let's say you're in a uh, Git repository and you make uh, some change and that you basically change one one to another. And then you can, you can easily see uh, what has been changed from the uh, previous commit. Uh, and uh, if, if it has effect on that, you can easily revert uh, to the previous change as well. Um, and of course, with configuration management is basically uh, these days, it's, it's heavily automated. Uh, if you don't automate your configuration management, you should start doing that now. Uh, otherwise, uh, you cannot address the challenges that are happening when you move to a cloud or you are uh, managing the cloud resources. Um, moving to the next slide, um, well, why do we need configuration management? That basically, um, when you start to do configura configuration management correctly uh, in an automated way, you basically start to increase the efficiency of your processes, of, of your work, and your operations. 
Uh, and of course, with efficiencies, uh, the cost is being reduced because you're you're spending less time on troubleshooting and uh, trying to uh, resolve issues that were caused um, by your change management process. Um, with this, uh, of course, we have agility and faster problem resolution because now we know what kind of changes are being made and you know exactly what you need to do in order to return to previous state. Uh, this, of course, enhance, enhances the reliability. Um, um, as I said as well, efficient change management process is uh, achieved as well. Um, faster restoration from failures uh, because you can uh, fully react on what you has, has been changed and reverted uh, right away. Um, this allows also for easier uh, auditing, so you have a full uh, way to see what has been changed, who has changed it and so on. Uh, if you're doing this from a single place and, and making, making it consistent uh, for your uh, resources, no matter if they are on Azure, on other parts, or um, if, if they are um, on-premises. With that, you also achieve better control and etc. etc. There are a lot of things that basically uh, contribute to um, um, being that a successful implementation for your environment. Uh, so let's start with start with change tracking and inventory. Um, basically, change tracking and inventory is for your uh, virtual machines. Uh, again, it doesn't matter where they are located. Uh, they can be in, in Asia uh, or not. Um, with Azure Arc and other technologies, you can basically uh, the VMs can be located anywhere. Uh, even they can be physical servers as well. Uh, but basically, uh, change tracking allows you to track uh, changes on Windows and Linux files. Um, for those, you can even have a way that you store the changes in the files on a storage account, and then you can review uh, the, the differences between the, the previous file and the current file. Uh, um, so you can basically uh, track exactly the contents of the file that has been changed. Uh, you can track changes on Windows registry. That's only for Windows, obviously. Um, you can track changes on installed software. Um, that's both Linux and Windows. Um, any software that is installed via some proper channels like MSI, etc., you're going to see in Windows and uh, in Linux when you use the um, appropriate tools uh, there. Uh, it tracks change uh, states of Windows services and Linux uh, daemons. Um, basically, these are the, the services that are running, so you can see if service has stopped or not, and etc. Uh, moving that to the demo, so um, we can use the public um, demo for Log Analytics workspace um, to see um, what kind of changes are being made. So let's see for files. Uh, for files, you can see I'm using the public uh, repository here, so I can see that the name of the files is host. So I'm going to take just one record here. Uh, and uh, we basically see that uh, at this time there was a change um, to modify the file. So uh, here you don't see the content. Um, if you have that integration, then uh, you're going to use the uh, Azure Automation uh, UI uh, for change tracking to see actually what kind of uh, contents are being changed uh, because this is the public. Um, workspace that Microsoft has provided as a demo environment. Um, we don't have that integration. We basically have access to the, the logs only. Um, but uh, if you set that with the storage account, then you're going to see the, the actual changes. Uh, and if you are um, monitoring something, basically you can create alerts based on that to track specific files if you want to, uh, and maybe even who has, who has done the change and et cetera. Um, we can look at the, the registry changes as well. Uh, we can see that we have added, removed, and etc. different kind of uh, categories for, for the registry. Uh, we can see here that basically uh, here a registry was added. Um, um, you can see the value name, the value data that was um, uh, added uh, for that uh, registry, etc. So you, you can easily track those. Uh, so that was the public one. Um, moving back to um, the state changes, 
um, basically gonna show you how you can, for example, track um, states for uh, Windows services. Um, we have the configuration change table. Uh, we scope the, the change to Windows services type, uh, the category to modify. So we only want to when um, a service was modified and then uh, we want um, the type to be the state of the service uh, and we want the state to be stopped. So basically every time we see that a uh, service has been stopped on, on the server, we want to have information for that. And then we have another uh, filter here. Uh, this filter basically um, scopes it to specific uh, services um, that we that are, think we are critical for our operating system. Uh, we have DNS client here, uh, Windows uh, event log, and etc. Um, so basically, uh, we want to get a uh, signal on that. Uh, um, the rest of the part is something that uh, I use in order to build uh, alert. With that uh, query, I can directly build an alert for that. Uh, just because uh, by using uh, aggregated value, I'm assigning the specific value there, one, this is a static value. Uh, we use that value as a threshold because basically our filtering is happening here and we need some mock-up value that uh, we need to uh, get into the threshold for the alert. Um, we use summarize with uh, aggregation max uh, operator here. Um, basically, we just want the, the latest record. So everything that has resource ID and display name the same, we just want to be listed uh, uh, in a single, um, uh, in the, we want to list the only the latest value, uh, latest record. Uh, so we don't want to list um, the service being stopped for the same service for the same computer twice, for example. Uh, with that, um, when we build uh, this into alert, uh, we can make it a metric measurement alert uh, and basically every time when the resource ID and the service display name are different, uh, we're going to get um, a separate alert instance for that. So if I have um, DNS client and a Windows event log stopped on VM0001, uh, I'm going to get two separate alerts when I use uh, this query in the alert. Uh, so that basically um, uh, allows us to basically file alerts per instance, and then in this case, the instance is not only the computer or the resource ID, but also the name of the, the service. Um, we can also see the same thing about configuration changes. Um, here I'm going to list uh, only changes that are from uh, Microsoft updates, but basically it can be also third-party software, so maybe some kind of application being installed. You can track those if you um, if maybe you have a whitelist uh, or maybe you have a specific list of, of service services that you want to monitor or specific services that you don't want to monitor, and then you make a query that uh, filters on those and uh, basically um, you can alert on uh, something unusual happening uh, like software being installed on, on your machines. Um, that of course is some kind of reactive way. It's always better to actually be more proactive where you basically uh, use other tools uh, that doesn't uh, where you can use for example AppToker and other tools where you basically um, don't allow installation of, of a certain uh, software. Uh, so that's basically um, track, tracking changes in inventory. Um, maybe um, th there are two tables that are uh, basically exposed by this solution. One is the configuration change and the other is the configuration data. Um, the configuration change basically logs any changes that are happening um, um, on on the on the servers, and the configuration data is basically a snapshot that is being uh, done. I think every 24 hours, if I remember correctly, um, basically just 24 hours on the things that you're monitoring, uh, you get uh, every 24 hours you get uh, the information, so you know which service, what kind of state it has, um, is it does it has um, let me go to this one. 
Uh, does it has um, service startup uh, as manual or uh, it's automatic, etc. So you get that uh, for for the services, for the registries, for the files, etc. So basically, you get a snapshot for them. Um, moving to the actual UI, if you want to see the UI of, of uh, change tracking inventory, you can see it uh, here in the automation account. Uh, basically, this will uh, give you some default uh, dashboards that you can see. Uh, the most important here, here is the edit settings. Uh, with the edit settings, uh, you basically you can add uh, additional configurations here. Um, keep in mind that once you add a configuration, it applies to all the servers that are onboarded to the solution. Uh, it's important maybe to um, reduce every time the Windows service states, by default it's 30 minutes, uh, but uh, I would suggest that you either put it on one minute or uh, 10 seconds or 30 seconds. Everything that is below one minute should be okay in order to uh, have a relevant monitoring. Otherwise, if you have it every five minutes, uh, the data will come every five minutes, so you might not know uh, on time if, if something has, uh, if some service has been stopped. Uh, so that's basically change tracking. Uh, it's um, it's fairly, um, I think, known solution because it has been uh, there for quite some time. Um, so we probably you are familiar with it. Now moving to the map. This was the demo. Sorry about forgetting this slide. I'm moving to application change analysis. Um, this is a fairly new uh, service in Azure. I think it's maybe in preview and we are yet to see more uh, of it. Uh, but basically, application change analysis is, is the same like change tracking, but it's tracking changes on Azure resources um, instead of, of VMs. Um, it's a native Azure service. Um, it, it's um, um, basically scoped to the management plane. So um, things that you do on Azure resources is on their management plane of these resources. So for example, configurations on storage accounts, configuration on SQL servers, SQL databases. But for example, if you're doing changes in the SQL database itself, then you have to enable additional auditing and that's where um, it's the data plane, not the, the management plane. So that requires enabling additional auditing for, for those parts. Uh, it's based on the resource graph. Uh, the resource graph is basically um, a graph that basically has information for all the services um, in Azure, or at least most of the services in Azure. Uh, there are still some, let's say, resources uh, that are not exposed there. Um, but uh, basically, the, the main ones are, are, are there, uh, the, the top-level resources. Um, it has integration with Activity Log and Azure Policies, where you, uh, Azure Policy, where you can basically uh, see those changes from a UI perspective. So when you look when you uh, look at Activity Log with Azure Policy, you can basically navigate uh, to uh, change analysis and see those changes. Uh, it's not yet integrated with log analysis, meaning that um, basically you have currently some API that basically is being queried when you view things from the portal. Uh, but the actual changes uh, or the things that are being changed are not being blocked as logs um, uh, on, in log analytics. Uh, I think that's easy yet to come because um, if you follow um, different things, you see that basically at the end, uh, there is always some kind of low end disintegration that is happening when it's related uh, to us in Asia. Uh, so let's proceed uh, to the demo of that. Uh, basically, if you track, if you write application change analysis, you can select there is a special blade for that. As I said, you, you can also uh, see that information from uh, activity log, for example. Um, Let's see this kind of resource. I'm gonna navigate to the resource. I'm gonna go and change uh, settings. So let's disable secure transfer. Uh, and we can navigate back. Uh, 
Uh, it, sometimes it might take a few seconds until the information appears. So yeah, uh, so we can now see that the change count has increased. Uh, and if you click here, we're gonna see that we have change property. Uh, and we can see exactly what has been changed. Uh, you can see that basically by um, disabling that kind of uh, featuring from the portal, it basically changes the property on the resource. We can see the value turning from true uh, to false. Uh, and basically we can track uh, those changes. This of course, uh, when, when we see sometimes in the future integration with low analytics, probably will be useful to Based on this one, we can create alerts maybe for specific resources uh, types and specific properties that you want to monitor and you don't want to be changed. Of course, um, you can always um, configure an Azure policy uh, that basically prevents you from configuring uh, these two faults at the first place. Um, so that's um, because Azure policy is sitting on top of uh, uh, Azure Resources is basically uh, on the same uh, level as Azure Resource Manager. Basically, uh, no matter if you're using KSDK Portal, ARM Templates, PowerShell, CLI, or something else, uh, you basically uh, you cannot change uh, something if the policy, if Azure policy doesn't allow you to do that. Uh, so it's very unique feature for for the Azure for Azure uh, the way that it works. Um, so, yeah, we see the change here. I think here somewhere you can navigate to the actual activity log, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can also see only this change and etc. Um, yeah, I don't think maybe they have integrated that feature where you can uh, see that. But I'm going to show you as well what happens in the activity log. Um, you go here. Uh, we we have done this change. You can see this is in done through my account. If we look at change history, you see that exact property being changed from true to false. So uh, this is basically the integration that I was mentioning. And you can also drill down from here and see um, the exact change happening there. Uh, now that we know uh, this has happened, I can go and, and basically revert that change. And, and make sure that my storage account is secure. Okay, um, this was uh, my second demo. We can move to the next part. Uh, so Azure Resource Manager deployments, uh, as I said, we're gonna cover a lot about this um, in the next um, demos as well. Um, basically, Azure Resource Manager deployments allows you to deploy Azure and non-Azure resources. Uh, this happens through integration from Azure Arc. So, uh, for example, if you have um, Azure Arc enabled server on Azure, you can install, for example, the Log Analytics extension, and that is a resource that you basically deploy uh, through Azure and you deploy it on the, the VM. Uh, so, you can monitor that uh, VM from, from Log Analytics. Um, there is something called custom resource provider as well, where you basically can write your own um, resource providers. Um, they might connect to a third party service and basically um, you can, for example, let's say even create uh, Azure uh, AD accounts from there or service principles. Um, you basically have, uh, you're creating that custom resource provider and then um, the custom resource provider could be connected to some kind of Azure function that does these operations and make sure that uh, the input that that creates what you are expecting uh, from from the uh, provider and then uh, uh, provide some kind of output as well. Um, there is something called deployment scripts where you can also use it for creating something uh, that maybe is not available measure and because basically deployment scripts is, is the script uh, PowerShell for example that you can uh, connect to something and uh, do, do something else. Um, Azure Resource Manager is not just about deploying the, the resources so but managing, managing their life cycles from, from end to end uh, 
about the resource. Uh, so, for example, as every single resource doesn't say, stay the same way that it was deployed, you have some changes that are happening over time. Uh, so, basically, um, Azure Resource Manager make sure that these changes are consistent uh, when you made them. It has some, some built-in uh, item potency uh, features and etc. that you can uh, use. Uh, you have the, the declarative syntax for resource manager. Um, you have the orchestration where you can uh, deploy things in parallel, wait for some things to be deployed before others are executed, etc. Allows you to, to do some kind of uh, modularity by having uh, multiple templates that are linked between each other, so we can um, have a template that creates a storage account, another that creates a web app, and etc. And you can basically link those uh, together in a single solution. Uh, allows you to preview changes. There is a new feature that uh, is what if. Basically, uh, when you execute a what if, um, you're going to see what kind of changes are happening uh, before the actual deployment starts. Uh, so if you say you change some properties from true to false, you're going to see that being marked uh, and you can say, okay, if those changes are fine for me, I can continue and do the actual deployment. Uh, it allows us at scale management because uh, with Azure Resource Manager deployments, you can do deployments at the resource group level, at subscription level, at management group level, and at tenant level. Um, and it allows you to uh, deploy things to multiple resource groups, for example. Uh, so you can manage um, one solution, maybe spans across uh, multiple resource groups, you can manage it at once, and you can execute those uh, tasks in parallel, in, in sequence, etc., whatever you have defined uh, there for logic. And it's ideal for CI CD, so if you haven't used uh, CI CD or configuration, integration, configuration, uh, deployment. I would suggest strongly to adopt those practices there. Um, and um, if you want, you can use Azure Resource Manager for that um, because um, the CI CD doesn't uh, scope you to specific uh, technology, but um, uh, both both uh, work uh, well with uh, with manager uh, resource manager deployments. Uh, you might see some other third parties uh, services like Terraform, etc. But I would strongly suggest to uh, consider using Paynotes CI CD with uh, resource manager deployments, uh, just because uh, CI CD is just a, like a Swiss army knife. Uh, you can do a lot of things, and uh, it's very familiar with many development developers, etc. Where you can basically um, working at DevOps team and, and uh, integrate uh, together um, the, these uh, deployments and, and the testing as well because uh, CI CD is not just about the deployment itself but it's about the full life cycle of, of um, make, making changes to your application, your environment, etc. And um, of course it could be your uh, not just applications but it's used also as I said for the infrastructure as well. Uh, which we're going to see in the next uh, demos. Um, so, where was my next demo? Did I find it? Yeah, it's here. Uh, basically, I have uh, Azure DevOps repository here, a simple one. Um, I have um, a simple pipeline definition, and the pipeline is basically the definition of CI CD. Um, we have uh, two steps. Um, two steps that we have uh, one is copying files to a storage account. Uh, basically, um, every template that they make, like JSON templates for the ARM template deployments, uh, they are staged to storage account. Uh, and from there, I can use them to actual deployment. That basically uh, allows me to use multiple templates uh, because they are stored on a storage account and basically uh, reference them from a URL when I'm uh, using the, uh, the templates. You're going to see later how. Um, and of course, because I want to be this secure, I'm basically issuing a SAS token for the storage account and using that SAS token to access the, the templates that are being uh, uh, so basically two tasks, one is copying these files to the log storage 
and the other is actually executing our resource management deployment on a subscription level. If we look at the templates, we have basically uh, one template that is the main template. This is which starts the deployments, if any subsequent templates that they have. Um, that one has uh, different parameters. Um, they have different types, so some are strings. Here we have objects, etc. Um, we have different API versions for the uh, different resources that we're going to deploy. Uh, in this case, we have one resource group that I'm going to deploy. And once that resource group is uh, deployed, I'm basically starting another resource manager deployment. Uh, we are linked template, as, as I said, uh, basically here I am uh, creating a path to the, to the uh, alerts JSON file that is being uploaded on the storage account and passing that in the template URI. Um, so when the resource group is created, I'm starting another template. This template is started on the resource group level. So what I'm doing is basically creating an alert uh, or two alerts in this case. Um, some parts of my um, code is being commented for reasons to just show you some specifics about this deployment. I'm going to go to the parts where basically um, I'm uh, actually deploying resources. Uh, so basically I'm deploying the resource uh, schedule query rules. Uh, if you are not familiar with that, that's basically log analytics alerts. Um, I have uh, basically creating uh, a name for that by using a GUI uh, and also have display name for the alert as well. So the display name is something that you're going to see in the portal when you look at uh, the alert. I have a description as well uh, for that one, uh, location, I can provide tags for the alert resource. Um, the alert is being deployed as enabled. Um, I have the queries being referenced here, as you can see, um, it's one of the queries that I'm using a lot. Uh, basically, I want to get alert on every um, uh, server and every uh, disk that is going below 10% of uh, free disk space. Um, the data source, I'm basically attaching to the log analytics workspace that I want to have. In this case, the log analytics workspace is provided as parameters. We're going to see that uh, in a minute. Uh, we have a frequency of five minutes and time window of five minutes. So basically the alert will be executed every five minutes and uh, the information that we'll be get, getting from the log entities workspace will be for the last five minutes. Um, I have severity here and the severity is basically assigned from a parameter as well. Uh, I don't have throttling. Um, here I have I don't attach an action group, but I can actually attach one if I want to. Uh, and the threshold here in this case is 99%. I have another alert, it's, it's similar, it's the same query that I used before. Um, maybe I forgot to change the query, but anyhow. Uh, but uh, basically uh, allows me to uh, do the same, deploy another alert here. Uh, you saw that some values are not directly um, put into the, the properties here. Basically, I'm getting them from parameters. If you look here, um, I basically have a parameters file. Basically, this is what is being passed to the deployment as, as input parameters. So I want this to be inside Azure Management Resource Group. Uh, I want to be in location East US because also the Low Analytics workspace is there in that uh, region. Uh, and here I'm providing the, uh, the action group. In this case, I'm not assigning currently action group, but I have these parameters. I'm providing the name of the log analytics workspace, the region, and the severity that I want to attach to the alert uh, and the threshold. In this case, the threshold is currently static, but I'm going to show you how I can make it um, as, a, uh, as a parameter. Uh, with that said, every time when I commit something to um, this repository, uh, basically I'm going to execute uh, a CI CD pipeline. Um, this is the simplest example, of course. It's not something that uh, you should use correctly as a production, but um, I just wanted to show you the simplest way of doing that. As I haven't done any commit now, 
I'm can, I can actually go and uh, run this pipeline uh, manually. So I'm going to go and say run my hook. And this will start the job. Um, and if you go here, we don't see the resource group that I was mentioning. So once it's give that, it's basically we're going to create that uh, resource group. Uh, so let's wait uh, on that one today. It's good. There are some system tasks that are being executed and the staging files is the, the, the task that they showed you about copying the, the storage, uh, the templates, the storage account. Bear with me while this is being executed. You can see some statistics from the plot, and now the once the plot is uh, succeeding, uh, we can proceed with the next task of um, doing the actual deployments of the template. It says it's starting deployment with name this one. And now this is uh, succeeded. So if I go here and refresh, I can see my the, my resource group created. Uh, you can see I have the tags on that one. I you will not see resources just because uh, basically uh, the the alerts are basically a hidden resource, so you have to check it out. Uh, you can see they have these uh, random, not randomly generated, but um, um, let's say not non friendly names of these resources. Um, if you look them, they are just uh, like a basic resource. Uh, but if I go here on the alerts part and see manage alert tools, I can see those uh, alerts appearing and you can see that uh, basically the display name here appears correctly. Uh, so I have uh, these these alerts uh, created. Um, if you look at the configuration here, you can see that uh, basically we have threshold of 99 uh, frequency and etc. Uh, so everything that is what I have defined in the configuration is being deployed. And now I can go and actually make some changes to uh, this one. Uh, so this is my, uh, well, this space alert, let's say I want the threshold not to be static. So I'm gonna do this one. I'm gonna just copy this part. And basically for this kind of object, I want uh, to set a threshold. And then in my parameters, you can see I have uh, the threshold actually here. So I don't need to add this, this parameter here. I can just uh, leave it as this and it will change to 10. And so if you change that, I can say adding threshold value to all this space alert. Now I'm going to permit that change. And now it's when it's committed, the pipeline will start automatically. As you can see, already started. Uh, this is my commit that I have added, and it starts in the pipeline. So it's going to change that value. Again, we have to wait for the deployment. But what's good in those situations is that you can just go and grab a coffee or something else and just let it to the automation do its part. While waiting this to, to happen, um, basically I can go and do the same thing for, uh, for other properties. I can, for example, have a resource group. Um, 
that I want to attach, I can change if I want to the, the threshold operator, although in this case it doesn't make sense uh, because usually you want to uh, have uh, less than something, right? I mean, in this case, uh, this one doesn't matter. It's, it's this one that uh, is uh, important. So this one that does uh, less than 10% uh, threshold uh, is the value. Uh, something that I can provide them as an option is the uh, uh, time window. Uh, but again, when I change the time window, I also have to do change here as well to change the, the frequency of uh, the time window here as well, because otherwise it, you might not get very consistent uh, working or not desired effect that you want to achieve. Uh, but all these things can be parameterized. Basically, we have a function in, in um, in ARM templates where you basically can replace a certain value with something uh, if you want to. Uh, so this is now done. Uh, and I can navigate to the alert. So the alert is here. Uh, load this place. And uh, you can see the threshold now is 10, right? So basically, um, without uh, uh, having to do something from the portal, I just changed uh, something from my solution, and then uh, this has been changed. Uh, and you can use something place to build uh, basically solutions for uh, monitoring, solutions for deploying SQL, solution for deploying web app, for solutions for deploying your enterprise application that consists of SQL, web app, uh, maybe Redis cache as well, etc. Uh, and you can uh, also generalize these deployments by having um, the parameters. So um, in case you have multiple teams or if you have customers, uh, basically you can provide them with these templates and then they can configure um, the thresholds or the values according to their own needs. Uh, so um, then you become uh, something that you can reuse uh, between the multiple deployments. You just change uh, the parameters. Uh, if we compare this to ESCOM, as you know, some of you are uh, coming from that background. Uh, basically, ARM templates is the way to package uh, solutions, uh, management packs. Uh, basically, you can have, you can deploy alerts, you can deploy uh, workbooks and etc. with a single um, solution in a template, uh, and that basically becomes your uh, a management pack, if you will, for log analytics or for Azure Monitor, uh, because these are not uh, tied to log analytics. You can have alerts that are tied that are metric alerts, for example, that you don't need even log analytics. Or the workbooks can be even uh, connecting to third-party sources for information, etc. Uh, so basically, that allows you to um, have um, your intellectual property basically uh, done in a in a, in a pack. Um, so that's on that demo. Uh, we're going to continue next one. Uh, there are more things about Azure Resource Manager Manager in the next ones as well. Um, State configuration, it's, it's, it's a service that has been quite some time on Azure. Uh, basically, uh, it's based on um, PowerShell uh, DSC. Uh, it's uh, in configuration management for your VMs. You can do both Azure and non-Azure VMs, supports both to Windows and Linux, so the Linux support is, is not quite um, good, I would say. You can do just monitor or enforce those settings. Uh, there are certain challenges at scale when you use that service, and uh, certainly we see that um, state configuration is being uh, somehow replaced uh, by uh, policy uh, guest configuration. Uh, and you have seen some of the messages there that, for example, policy configuration uses uh, a new DSC agent that is cross-platform, etc., rewritten from scratch, um, able to handle multiple configurations and etc. So all these things uh, that we are basically missing in uh, configuration, uh, in state configuration. Um, but um, to continue on that, I'm going to show you one demo here. 
Um, basically, I'm gonna start the deployment. I'm gonna explain what is happening uh, as soon as this one starts. Uh, it will ask me to log on, so let's log on. And our two factor ratification. Actually, don't need it because I already have a session here started. Uh, so, hopefully, this will allow me to Azure and we're going to start another template deployment. This one I am starting manually, but of course you can integrate that into the CI/CD pipeline. I just want to show you different uh, ways of, of doing things, and this is also coming straightly from uh, the book example. So I'm going to iterate on on some of the important stuff uh, from from that example. I do ask me for a password. So hopefully this will be correct. So you can see it's starting to deploy um, resources here. Um, like the, the previous example we have here, parameters. In this case, in the parameters, every parameter is basically um, in its own uh, its own every value is basically its own parameter where previously in the other example i used something called uh, like objects and more complex way of, of uh, providing configuration um, i think when we go from one level of farm template deployment to another you basically start to use more like objects and arrays in order to um, not have too many parameters because at some point you also need to uh, have some conditions like um, if I don't have that parameter you, then uh, you don't provide this one as well and etc uh, these kind of things that might be um, hard to document um, but it's basically the same approach I'm starting uh, an Azure, Azure uh, resource manager deployment um, these are the the main file that I'm using um, in this case, the files are not being uploaded to a storage account, but they are directly taken from our uh, book repository that we have. Um, I, you can see that they have a bunch of other um, templates that I'm starting as well. Um, what it does is basically, we'll deploy a major automation account with all the resources that are needed, like modules, uh, configuration, et cetera. Uh, then I deploy also uh, VM. And that VM basically gonna be promoted to uh, domain controller. I'm basically using uh, a PowerShell DSH in order to create a domain controller, um, which basically the, the configuration itself is this file. Uh, we can see that I'm using some uh, DSC resources that I'm importing. Uh, those I have, those are uh, I have ported in the PowerShell in the Azure automation. Um, uh, assets as a PowerShell modules, uh, and then I'm those automatically become available on the VM once the VM is attached to the um, to the automation account as a, a DSC node. Uh, and when the, the the configuration is being executed, I'm porting these these modules. I'm using assets in this case credentials from the um, uh, from the um, uh, Azure Automation account, um, and then uh, when we exit, I'm doing uh, some changes on the uh, server in order to uh, configure the main controller. So we got we have um, a the domain services installed. Uh, we are uh, waiting for a disk two to become available. We format the disk. Uh, we do uh, reboot before. Um, uh, we can start uh, the actual configuration of the domain controller and then uh, some some things here are static but you can also some parameterize some of these in order to 
uh, configure it to a different domain name, etc. Just like it's parameterized for domain credential and safe mode credential. So this one configures uh, the domain on drive F, um, uh, configures LD TCP or disables LDNA, FDP anyway. Uh, it sets the time zone here as well. Uh, it, do, it does DFS replication. Uh, uh, making sure that the service is being run there, uh, the DFS namespace service, and basically all the services that are related to uh, domain controller are functioning correctly, so they want to be always up. Uh, even has uh, the health service up here as well, uh, which is um, the monitoring agent service. Uh, if you go to the um, my uh, resources here. Um, we can see what was the name of that group. Management one uh, DC. Uh, you can see that the automation account is created. Uh, if we go to the assets, you can see the modules that are imported. So. Uh, those modules that you saw, as I said, they are being imported directly from the PowerShell gallery, and then from here they are imported on the DSC node. Uh, I've mentioned that I'm using credentials. These are the credentials that I have entered in the beginning, and now they are also credentials in the automation account, and then I use them in, in building the, the main controller. Um, so you can see all that uh, happening. Uh, if you look at the different uh, files, if you look at the automation resources, uh, you can see those uh, PowerShell modules being imported. I'm importing uh, those in a certain batch because uh, uh, you should not, you cannot import more than four, uh, more than five modules at a time. So I'm importing them uh, at the sequence. Um, here the, the workspace is created, the automation account is created. Uh, we are also sending the, the logs from automation account to Log Analytics. So if you want to monitor the, the DSC node status, we can do through that. Uh, this is a, uh, the module import. I'm using copy function to just define one import and then iterate to an array to import all the modules. Uh, this is the configuration that we are using. Uh, the credentials that I uh, showed you as well, um, and then we are, comp we are compiling the configuration so it's available for, for the node. Um, if you look at the uh, primary domain controller, which this is the VM, uh, we have network interface that is being deployed, uh, disks, uh, virtual machine, and most importantly is the extensions here. We have the log analytics extension that is being installed. Uh, and here is the DXC extension, which basically um, we connect them to the automation account um, by providing the registration URL, uh, the node configuration that you want to apply. And we say that uh, this is a client autocorrect uh, mode. So basically, uh, those configurations that we have defined, those will be applied immediately on the node. Uh, and there are additional DSC configurations here. Uh, but you basically see how um, I am uh, able to achieve end-to-end uh, -end deployment of, of um, not only the, the VM as Azure resource, but inside uh, the VM as well um, in a single deployment with ARM templates. And uh, it basically it reaches within the VM to do that. Uh, so uh, that's how we configure um, VMs. Um, so I'm going to let this to continue. I think we'll continue. It will take some time because um, it requires uh, some time to the main controller to be deployed. I might cancel it for the next demo, but let's see. Um, Azure policy. Uh, as I said, Azure policy is like um, becoming a replacement for the state configuration due to all the changes that I've mentioned. So for, for Azure policy, you can um, uh, basically manage resources that are Azure and not Azure. Again, with the uh, Azure R, um, there is a uh, policies that uh, not span only for VMs, but also for um, 
Kubernetes as well, no matter if the Kubernetes is located uh, on-premises. And I guess with, with more Azure Arc enabled services in the future, we're going to see more Azure policies spanning across uh, not only Azure, but other clouds uh, like AWS, uh, Google, uh, and also on-premises because it really doesn't matter uh, where they are located. Um, particularly, as I want to mention, the guest configuration for uh, VMs currently only in monitor mode. There is one um, one policy that currently you can do uh, actual configuration that is being applied, and I'm going to show you that. Um, um, as I said, the enforced mode is being planned, as it seems, because of that uh, policy that that policy that is available. And I would assume that in the future we're going to see more. Uh, you can create custom policies as well, uh, so you are not scoped only to the ones that Microsoft provides or Azure provides uh, in the portal. You can actually create your own policies. Um, uses the new DSC agent that is fully written, as I said, it's cross-platform and, as I said, it's also not supported on Azure resources. Um, another thing that I've also already mentioned is that Kubernetes support um, and uh, Measure Policy is one of the first services where the, the status from within a resource or within uh, or from external resources being reported directly to Azure, and that's the, the compliance that is being sent if, if something is compliant or not. Uh, and it's is scalable because um, you can apply um, policies on, on different levels in Azure. Um, those can reach to different resources. And, it's a one view, not that you can see the compliance and you can see your configuration of resources in a single uh, in a single view, uh, rather uh, moving through through different uh, views. Uh, so while that is continuing, basically um, I'm having this uh, again ARM template deployment because policies uh, you can deploy to ARM templates as well. So uh, basically, you can manage the life cycle of those policies through ARM template deployments. Um, what I'm doing is I'm going to assign uh, a time zone to a specific um, server. Um, spoiler alert, the zone is already applied, of course, um, just to not have to wait for something to happen. Uh, but um, the point is that this has happened through um, through Azure policy and not from the deployment itself, because when I redo deployments currently, um, if you don't specify a time zone on the deployment, it automatically sets to UTC. So in my case, the VM that I have previously deployed uh, doesn't have a time zone, so it's UTC. Um, and what we start here, again, is an arm to play deployment. Uh, we have um, these allowed values, basically the different uh, time zones that we can assign. Um, I'm basically starting a policy assignment. This deployment is started on subscription level, so the policy itself is supplied to the subscription. Uh, so any VM that is on on that um, on that subscription, it will have uh, that policy enabled. So basically, we have a policy assignment uh, which references a policy definition ID. So as this definition ID or the policy definition is already built in by Microsoft, I'm just referencing here. And I'm providing the value here uh, of what I want to um, what I want to uh, zone the zone to be on the VMs. Um, additionally, I'm doing another policy assignment. So um, the way that currently um, the S configuration for this policy works is that you have to apply two policies. One is to configure the the time zone on the Windows machines, and the other is to uh, install a few prerequisites uh, in order to get configuration policy to work on on the VMs. Um, this one will be executed only when this is uh, available, of course. So um, this one will start that um, because. Um, when you assign this from the portal, we're going to see that you basically uh, enable something called managed identity as well. Um, in this case, uh, we are um, doing crow assignments on the managed identities that uh, are going to be created. So you can see here, um, 
we have one system identity, a system assigned identity for this policy, and another system assigned identity for uh, this policy. The system assigned identities, if you delete the policy assignment, they will be deleted automatically as well. Uh, but uh, in order to uh, to have some kind of permissions, we need to assign uh, permissions on the system system assigned identities. Um, we do this through uh, role assignments. We assign the airbag, uh, so we basically assign contributor uh, access to both uh, to both uh, system assigned identities. Uh, this one here is important. It's service principle. Um, uh, it needs to be uh, set to service principle. Uh, the reason behind that is that when you create a system assigned identity, it's not created right away. It takes like um, it may take like five minutes in order to be created in Azure AD. Uh, so um, in order not to wait uh, until that uh, system assigned identity is fully, let's say, replicated across uh, Azure AD. Uh, we basically um, say that uh, do the role assignment that identity exists and uh, uh, once it is available, it will have those permissions. Um, so I will not try to demo the deployment, but basically the deployment is simple. I'm going to say deployment, as you can see here, is you just basically deploy and it's, it's there. I already have this policy deployed. Um, so I'm on this uh, demo change tracking resource group. As I said, the policy is on a um, um, resource group level, but whatever policy applies to the resources will be visible if you go here to policies. And then we see this one configure uh, time zone. You can see the other as well. Uh, you can see both are compliant. Uh, we can click here because resource compliance is fully compliant. There is no non-compliant resources, but we can see that uh, there are resources where this has been um, deployed. And you can see the date when I have done this one. And you can see this is basically the, the PowerShell uh, DSC configuration that we have applied. Um, this is the name of the, the configuration. Uh, it's compliant. Uh, and if you go here to the VM, I'm basically using run command to get the time zone from, from it within the VM. So if you run it, we should get the time zone. So we have to wait a little bit. And uh, this is the end of, of my presentation because this is the last demo. I think we can proceed to the questions while waiting because we're also at the time of the hour. So I hope that uh, the demos were interesting and you find something useful here. Yeah, fantastic, Stan, thanks very much. Um, and definitely a few questions coming in here. And for anybody, anyone asking questions, if, if your question doesn't get answered during this Q&A period, uh, I, I'm, we're, we're going to forward those to the speakers right after their session, so you should get answers uh, in, in a pretty reasonable amount of time. And if we miss your question, by all means, just reach out. Um, you know, none of us are, are secret people. We're all on social media, and we're happy to connect with you, connect you with our colleagues, etc., to make sure those questions get answered. That's really a big part of the live session, as we want you to be able to get those questions answered. So with that, Stan, yeah. let me um, throw a couple of the questions at you related to your session. So the first one here, do you find organizations, do you find many organizations using the update management solution in production? Yeah. Um, yeah, we certainly also use it uh, for our customers. Um, certainly I see some, some things that can be improved there. So. Uh, as always, if you have some feedback, try to address it to Microsoft. The more people try to um, put these issues out there, um, it's it's uh, the more easier it's to uh, force Microsoft to uh, make those changes. Uh, otherwise, um, we we still see that when you have to do something more complex, then it's more uh, uh, hard to use update management. In complex in terms of 
updating and batching where you have some kind of sequencing. Great, thank you. And and uh, follow up there. In in your opinion, can you achieve parity with uh, with Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager in terms of patch management functionality for your servers? Uh, parity, no. Um, certainly, you can achieve many of the things there. Uh, I think mostly you will be um forced with when you have to do some kind of pre and post task where there's still some some gaps there although there is kind of some kind of functionality there are still some gaps there uh, and certainly when you use update management also use WSS server because you're going to have problems if you just just uh, your servers are connected to windows update although with with the latest versions of windows it's easier for those because you just have those uh, cumulative updates um, but i would strongly suggest also use WSS if you have more servers and you want to achieve better control great and uh, another related question not related to to, uh, to update management to your session so do you expect Microsoft to produce more user-friendly ways to author DSC, so desired state configuration? Um, I certainly see that might be coming, uh, but uh, the thing that they need to focus is not so much providing an easier way to um, make the DSC configuration, but to use them, right? Uh, because yeah. Someone has to do the actual DSC resource, and that's where the um, uh, the most part of the hard code uh, hard code is there, right? Um, and you basically, when you use the uh, the DSC part, you basically reference something like configure that, configure this, and configure some uh, something else. Um, where I think it lacks is the uh, examples and the uh, documentation of these uh, DSC resources. And on top of that, I think we should have more uh, DSC resources for Linux, but I think with, with guest configuration, they're going into another direction where you can, I think, use uh, chef uh, recipes uh, in, in the guest configurations instead of DSC for Linux specifically. Great, thank you for that. Um, quite a few folks asking for URLs for the for the book for uh, for some of the offers. I'll I'll put those up on the screen just yeah. right after we finish this last question with Stan to make sure you have everything you need. And of course, after the event, uh, in the post event communication, you'll see uh, some some detail around all of those things. Uh, so last question, Stan, and I'm not sure how closely related this is to exactly your session. Uh, but are you able to test Terraform with the one-year test account? Um, I assume the answer is yes, but I've not I've not tried it recently. Yeah, here I can say just try resource manager deployments. There are a lot of things that are going to happen with resource manager deployments that going to ease things uh, easier. Uh, keep in mind that the Azure resource manager deployments are free. Uh, so you don't have to pay anything there. Um, you can just for the deployments to automate them, you can use just CI CD, which is widely used in, uh, I think, in many organizations. Uh, and another thing that is important is that, um, I kind of forgot my uh, thoughts, but um, yeah, basically when, when something is free, I think it's, it's worth uh, using that rather uh, paying for something that, um, you can achieve the, basically the same uh, results. That's right. Uh, let me just, I'm just going to pull up a few things here so we can share some of those URLs. Uh, maybe uh, what's important to say that um, multi-cloud is something that we hear a lot, but I don't see many people actually saying, uh, I'm going to take these parameters, I'm going to use them, and I'm going to deploy two VMs, one in Azure, one in AWS, for example, and yeah. this will be my application. I don't see these kind of scenarios. The platforms, they have parity on features, 
and certain uh, services, but uh, from uh, deployment point of view and usage point of view, they are different. And then it's a matter of creating the design according to the platform and not creating some general design because those differences might be critical for your application. 